This video is devoted to proving what I call the second little miracle of linear algebra. And that miracle is the fact that a matrix times its inverse equals the identity matrix regardless of the order in which the matrices are multiplied. To put it another way, a matrix commutes with its inverse. Now generally, matrices don't commute in a matrix product, and non-commutativity is a very general and very natural rule when it comes to matrices. So when we see such a powerful exception, it's at the very least puzzling. And I think if you look a little closer at what's going on, it becomes more than puzzling. It becomes mysterious and even a little bit miraculous. Let me give you once again an example of what I'm talking about. What you notice is that the way in which the numbers come together and multiply and then add to produce the same nine numbers in both cases is completely different depending on the order in which the matrices are multiplied. Just take a look at this one and compare it to this one. So to get this one, four comes together with negative four thirds, five and 11 thirds, and then six and negative two. And in the next case, it's two and negative two thirds, five and 11 thirds, and eight and negative two. Completely different combinations of numbers, except for the five and 11 thirds, which were found in both cases. Now, if we consider a different entry, let's say this one, I don't believe there will be any overlaps. Let's see here. So we need to take third column, second row. Correct. Four and one, five and minus two, six and one. And in the second case, it's three and negative two thirds, six and 11 thirds, and 10 and negative two. Completely different numbers interacting with each other, producing the exact same answers nine times over. So that's why I think it's a little miraculous. And something so surprising has got to have a very deep fundamental explanation. And it does. And the explanation comes from what most people call group theory. So this argument does not constitute group theory, but it's a central argument in any introductory group theory. And maybe the argument that I'm about to show you is so pretty that it'll inspire you to learn a little bit of group theory. I will be very happy if it does, but I just wanna say, don't overdo it. The world of abstraction is very addictive and not always very productive. So look for balance. Okay, so here's the proof. The proof will be based on another formulation of the same statement. Saying that a matrix commutes with its inverse is equivalent to saying that the right inverse equals the left inverse. So if we consider some inverse matrix, but only stipulate that it produces the identity when multiplying this matrix on the right, we'll call that matrix the right inverse. And then when we come from the left, we'll call that matrix the left inverse. And it's pretty clear that every matrix, if you think about decomposition and linear independence and take that perspective, that every matrix has a right inverse that's unique and a left inverse that's unique. Just think of linear systems and uniqueness when the columns are linearly independent. And, and you will see that that statement is true. The surprising part is that those two are the same matrix and that's equivalent to saying that matrix and its inverse commute. So our goal is to prove that the right inverse equals the left inverse. And it takes about this much space on the board, maybe a little more. So it's gonna go here. I'll largely step out of the shot and just devote this area to this beautiful little proof. And here's how it goes. So consider the right inverse. It's a matrix R, R for right, such that AR equals identity. And now consider the left inverse. It's the matrix such that LA equals identity. And our goal is to prove that R equals L. And as you can see, we're talking about matrices, but we're not looking here. This is a very profound, deep argument. It has nothing to do with the entries of matrices and with the mechanics of matrix multiplication. It has to do with something more fundamental. That something more fundamental, in this case, is associativity, as you're about to see. So what I'm going to do is take this identity 
and multiply both sides. I'm just moving i to the left a little bit to give myself space. And multiply both sides by r, a perfectly valid operation in matrix algebra. Take an identity, multiply both matrices by the same matrix on the consistent side. So LAR equals IR. And now notice that AR is the identity matrix. We have that from right here. So what we have on the left is L times identity, which is L. And on the right hand side, we have identity times R, which is R. And we have arrived at our conclusion that the left inverse equals the right inverse. And where did we use associativity, which was so critical? And once again, I remind you of what I said before. If matrix multiplication had not been associative, there would be no matrix algebra. Well, we used it right here, because when we initially multiplied both sides by R, it was this product that was being multiplied by R. And then we said, let's do this product first. We used associativity. That's the key to this argument. And you will find this proof in any introductory text on group theory, probably on page two. So there we go. This is a very short and very fundamental proof of the fact that the left inverse equals the right inverse, or equivalently that matrix and its inverse commute. Now, does this make it less of a miracle? In my mind, I don't think it makes it any less of a miracle. Yes, there is a short reason for it, but if you dig deeper, you will realize that this proof may raise more questions than it answers. It certainly gives us a very fundamental understanding of why this has got to be true if we have any hope of developing a beautiful algebraic framework. But you will see that there are some funny parts in this proof if you dig deeper. So one should only dig as deep as necessary and not overdo the digging. Always remember to move forward. And just to repeat what I was saying, in my mind, this doesn't make this fact any less surprising. I think it's actually maybe a little bit more uh, interesting at the very least, but we do have a very nice explanation of why this kind of behavior is at the very least to be expected.